Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In this podcast, I'll talk about ways we can lower our exposure to toxins in our home. I'll explain why lowering this exposure is especially important for our mental health. And I'll discuss why it's important for us to approach this with a healthy perspective so we can enjoy and feel safe in our homes and not live in fear. This is one of those areas where we do the best we can and know that whatever we do is removing some of an overall toxic load. It helps to know that there's no perfection here. We are not going to have a toxin-free home. Some of us, depending on our health issues, may choose to do more than I'm discussing here today. As you'll notice, some of the tips are more about maintenance. Maintaining a healthy home isn't just about making some changes and you're good to go. Some of these are akin to car maintenance. You plan on checking some things regularly and addressing problems proactively instead of when the problem becomes so big or we become so sick that there's more that we have to do. So even though this information that I'm sharing, some of it will be basic, I will likely be bringing up tips that you may not have yet thought about. Even for me, going through these lists are good reminders. I've myself had environmental illness, and I find myself not wanting to think about some of these things, but I need to. I do, however, get concerned about a lot of the fear-inducing content that's out there when it comes to environmental issues, which is why before I start, I would encourage you to really try to shift your perspective to seeing this as an opportunity to learn and not as an opportunity to become stressed. A stress perspective could look like this. Maybe you haven't considered or done some of these things. Maybe while listening to this, you start to think about what looks like mold growth under the sink. Maybe while or after hearing these tips, you become overwhelmed and think the only way to relieve that anxiety is to make all of these changes as fast as possible. That stress itself, however, will have health impacts, including keeping your detoxification organs from working as well and causing inflammation. Obviously, I've been there, first when I discovered I had mold toxicity, and then when I realized I had electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And while that can sound like bad luck, Uh, These actually do often occur in the same individuals. But there is another way to approach this, which is to think about this as optimizing your home so you can optimize your brain health and your physical health and consider it a process, one in which requires one step at a time and feel good about this just as you would any other form of self-care. I call these tips for a happy home because our brain is often the first and the most affected organ in the body when it comes to the impacts of toxins. Think of the brain as a barometer of how much toxicity or inflammation we may be dealing with. One doesn't have to have depression, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia to be dealing with symptoms related to toxins in their home. Symptoms could be subtle, such as making more mistakes, memory issues, problems focusing or getting things done. It could be fatigue or sleep problems. In our relationships, it could be more arguments or being more reactive. I've seen a number of families where multiple family members had mold toxicity and there was a lot of high reactivity and a lot of conflict, mostly being fueled by mold. When we are toxic, our body perceives a threat. It puts us on guard. We don't feel safe. But that threat is within us in the form of a toxin and not necessarily the person we may be reacting to. Obviously, it can be both. We may have a stronger reaction than we would but for the toxicity. So whether we live alone or with other people, consider these tips about promoting our happiness our relationships, our focus, productivity, and even preventing future health issues and early cognitive decline. And again, if considering these tips makes you feel stressed, 
then really back off and slow things down. I'll be talking about these in three parts, mold, toxins, EMF, and chemical toxins. So if you do recognize yourself as someone who tends to worry or ruminate around uh, this type of information, then consider listening to just parts of this at a time. So what exactly do toxins do? And I go into much more depth about how toxins go through the body and the impacts on the body in a former podcast on what is called oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is when our body's antioxidant system is overwhelmed such that it can no longer do its job to protect us from free radicals And it's free radicals that will cause cell death and tissue damage and inflammation. And once this antioxidant system that we come by naturally is overwhelmed, then we are more vulnerable to the effects of further toxins or toxicants. And I'll just point out, I'm using the word toxins to describe both toxicants, which are byproducts of man-made activity, so this would be things like chemicals and EMF, and toxins are more um, naturally made toxins, and that would be mold toxins, but we often will refer to toxins and toxicants together because essentially they are both having similar impacts on our antioxidant system. So again, the goal is to keep the overall burden low. And in our modern society, there is no way to completely avoid toxins. I think this can even, for some, provide a sense of relief because we are not going to be able to wipe our bodies or our homes free of toxins. We are actually born already with a toxic load and we are regularly breathing in, drinking, eating, and even getting toxins through our skin. Some of us have a more robust detoxification system and some of us don't. For example, those of us with undermethylation, which I've discussed in a previous podcast, and which very much relates to a lot of brain-related conditions, not only causes lower serotonin activity, higher histamine states, but it also can convey a vulnerability to toxicity. And I should add, too, my expectation is that many, if not most, people actually listening to this podcast probably are undermethylated. And those of us who are undermethylated are also the ones who are more likely to go after limiting our exposure, and sometimes to a fault, because people that are undermethylated have a propensity to be strong-willed, perfectionistic, in some cases, even having obsessive-compulsive tendencies. So if you think you might be undermethylated, know that you may more easily lose the big picture of healing. And again, it's important to keep a healthy, balanced perspective on how you approach not only your health, but your home. So I'll start with mold toxins and know that about 25% of people appear to be more susceptible to mold toxicity and unable to mount an immune response to mold toxins. However, we do believe that anyone exposed long enough into a large enough amount of mold toxins will become toxic. And mold toxicity is about water damage in buildings. I'm not talking about mold out in nature. Mold out in nature has checks and balances, and it's really when moisture is retained in a space that there will be mold growth, the types of mold that will put off spores with toxins that are harmful to human health. Simply getting out of the environment or lowering mold toxins and exposure in a home doesn't necessarily remove the toxins from the body. I have a blog post on mold toxicity where I discuss how mold toxicity is treated. But onto the tips. 
So the first tip would be that if you have a leak, address it immediately. Again, where there is retained water or moisture, there will be mold growth. And it doesn't take but 48 hours before that will begin. Another consideration along these lines. If you have a child who wets the bed, to also be very aware that cushioned furniture, including mattresses, when they become wet, will grow mold inside. I've seen a couple of extremely sick children who had mold toxicity from their mattresses. Aside from addressing leaks immediately, the other would be to do some maintenance and checking. This could be periodically taking everything out from under the sink to see if there are any leaks under there. It could be having your roof checked once a year. It could be checking behind your refrigerator if there's a water source to your refrigerator. It could be paying attention to any stain that shows up on the ceiling Uh, warped wood in the flooring that could indicate some water damage. So obviously this is not a comprehensive list, but more to give you an idea of things to think about. So a third tip would be to keep your humidity low, around 50%. And you can get a small hygrometer on Amazon. They run somewhere between $8 and $10, and they will tell you what your humidity is. And you'll see uh, variations in terms of what people say when mold growth will start to occur. Some will say 56 and above for 48 hours or longer. So if you find that you have high humidity in a room, and I would say having lived in Florida and even here in Kentucky, um, humidity is high, this issue can cause mold growth on the surfaces, also within the ductwork. And keep in mind, this isn't just about basements, which are especially prone to high humidity. While there are whole house dehumidifiers, there are also standalone dehumidifiers that you can get. You can get those that you manually empty when full. And this could be that you're even emptying it once or twice a day. And then there's others that have a hose that will allow you to drain the water into a drain, for example, in a basement. Or you can purchase a pump that will allow the water to drain into a sink. Along these lines, make sure that the bathroom fan is on when you're taking a shower or taking a bath. Let it run 20 minutes after a shower And I would also say avoid humidifiers. They are obviously not what we want here. Another group of tips would relate to windows. So pay attention to windows, especially if they're leaking. You may look into the corners to see if there has been water damage on the windowsill or if the wood is rotting. Also look for areas on the window maybe particular crevices that could be holding moisture and then mold growth. Make sure the caulk looks good and that things are well sealed. Something people often don't think of would be to avoid keeping curtains closed for extended periods. Inevitably, there will be mold growth behind those curtains. Again, where there's retained moisture, in this case, it will be due to condensation being covered by the curtain, there will be mold growth. If you have a house, make sure that the water is moving away from the house, and so this relates to both the land around the house but also to your gutters. So you can walk around your house, and what you want to see is the land sloping away from your house so that it's not settling near the foundation. You'll want to pay attention to gutters. Are they working properly or are they clogged with leaves or debris? Mold toxins will accumulate in dust, so you really want to avoid dust accumulation through dusting, but also through changing your air filter every two to three months. 
and consider putting an air filter with a high MERV rating, M-E-R-V, and this is the number on the filter. I think on Amazon you can get them up to 13. You do want to make sure that it's compatible with your system so that there's not too much resistance. You might make sure that you put this on your calendar so that you don't forget to make that change. Caulking, I mentioned in relation to windows, but know that it can also be very important around sinks, especially in the kitchen. There can easily be water that goes between the seam of the sink and the counter and could lead to some moisture getting below the sink and causing mold growth there, which is fairly common actually. Again, there's always more that someone can do, but mainly just do your checks, address spills and leaks right away, keep humidity low, keep curtains open as much as possible, be aware of windows, gutters, and moving the water away from your house, and keep the dust low. Okay, so on to EMF or electromagnetic fields. We don't think of EMF naturally as being a toxicant, but it actually is, and it has many of the same impacts on the body as more obvious toxicants, such as chemicals. And this includes depleting the body's antioxidants, such as glutathione, which is the most important antioxidant in the body. And I mentioned with toxins the brain-related symptoms But know that for toxins and toxicants, the physical symptoms very commonly are more rapid aging. It can also be weight gain, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmune conditions. So really any chronic health conditions can be the result of this high oxidative stress that I mentioned. So there are different forms of EMF depending on where they fall on the EMF spectrum. So different electromagnetic fields have different frequencies and amplitudes. And when you hear EMF discussed, it includes radio frequencies, which come off wireless devices. And then there's magnetic frequencies, which come off motors primarily. So these would be cars and appliances Then there is just your regular electricity that we have running through wires in our homes. And then there's dirty electricity, which is a mixture of electromagnetic fields, some of which are coming from the outside, some are due to faulty wiring. Uh, Because radio frequencies are, in many regards, the worst form of EMF, And because we're all increasingly exposed to wireless devices and technology, I'll be focusing these tips on these. But for those who have EHS or electromagnetic hypersensitivity, they may need to consider these other forms as well. And if you are not convinced of how high some of the items in your house may read when it comes to EMF, For radio frequencies, again, Wi-Fi or wireless technology, there's a meter called the Safe and Sound Pro 2, and it will easily show you what are the electromagnetic fields coming off certain items in your home. And if you think about just imagining concentric circles coming off your computer, if you're using Wi-Fi, coming off anything using Bluetooth, coming off your cell phone, coming off your modem if you're using Wi-Fi, a booster if you have a smart air conditioner, garage door, sprinkler system. Just imagine concentric circles of electromagnetic fields coming off all of these. And they're reaching for each other. So your computer is reaching for the electromagnetic fields coming off your modem, which is sending them off. Your garage, if you have a smart garage door opener, the garage door opener is reaching for your cell phone. So 
as I go through these tips, you can weigh out the risk benefit ratio basically is, is it worth it to you to have these or is it worth it to try to lower the exposure? The first tip would be to find out if you have a smart meter. This will be on the side of your house and it will look very much like the meter that was an analog meter where someone would come out from the utility company and read it once a month to determine your usage. Now this is done remotely and the meter, if you have a smart meter, is emitting radio frequencies, not once a month, but on a regular basis. And you can call your utility company and request to opt out and they will come out and turn off the smart meter and turn it basically into an analog meter and someone will come out and read it. So if you're not sure, you can contact your utility company to ask them if you have a smart meter. Another tip would be to consider, again, if the smart technology in your home, if you have it, is worth it. I can just tell you my own experience in moving into a new house. When we moved into the house, we didn't appreciate that it had a ring doorbell, which is using radio frequencies. It had a smart thermostat, a smart sprinkler system, a smart garage door, and a booster on top of Wi-Fi and a smart meter. And we were living in close proximity to a cell tower. Especially for myself and my daughter, this was a massive EMF exposure and put the both of us into electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And I have a podcast about electromagnetic hypersensitivity, but basically it's when you're having um, pretty pronounced symptoms in the presence of EMF. And it starts to generalize where you feel it in the car, you feel it out in public places, you're able to know when you're near a cell phone that's on, and so forth. All of those sources that I mentioned can be addressed. The thermostat, in our case, was just a change in the settings to turn the Wi-Fi off. The ring doorbell, we were able to disable. The booster was turned off. The Wi-Fi was turned off, and we started using Ethernet cords. Now, if you use Wi-Fi, I would recommend, at the very least, to turn it off at night. Um, There's no reason to be getting that exposure for that extended period of time when you're not using it. And if you want to further lower your exposure, you can not use Wi-Fi during the day and plug your computers, even laptops, even cell phones, though they won't work for general texting or phone calls, but you can use adapters for tablets or laptops or phones to Ethernet cords that can run directly into your modem. So depending on the age of your house, you may have Ethernet connections in the wall. They look like phone connections, but they're a little bit bigger, and they will connect to your modem. If you don't have those, however, you can have those put in by an electrician, or you can simply run an Ethernet cord along the floor to the modem. And again, everyone's choices and what they want to do or what they would tolerate in terms of inconvenience will vary. I would also recommend that you turn off your phone or at least put it away from you on airplane mode at night. When you're sleeping, it can also be helpful to unplug anything in the room. You don't necessarily want to have a lamp plugged in by your bed Uh, It will be pulling electricity from the wiring, basically, in your house and putting that next to your head, even when it's off. I personally turn a breaker off to my bedroom. Uh, So, again, there are many lengths with which someone can, can go, and some people may choose to leave the lamp on. I would recommend, and this is not necessarily difficult for most people, is to avoid running a cord under your bed. Even if the items it's connected to aren't on, it's still drawing electricity. Regarding relationship with your phone, I would recommend keeping it away from your body. Use the speaker instead of holding it to your head. 
I'll need to do another podcast to discuss uh, what happens when you hold it to your head and to go through some of the research. However, know that holding it to your head or keeping it in your pocket or close to your body is even inconsistent with the fine print of the cell phone company information. There are phone cases that will shield most radio frequencies coming off of cell phones. And along these lines, you also don't want to have your cell phone on in the car. The radio frequencies get amplified. And when we have a cell phone in a car, it's like having it in a metal box. Those frequencies get increased. As I mentioned, use Ethernet when possible. You can also wire your keyboard and mouse. You can find those, you know, we more commonly see wireless now, but you can still buy a wired keyboard and mouse, and that allows you to turn off your Bluetooth. And if you are working on a laptop or a tablet, you still might consider using a keyboard so that you're not putting your hands directly in contact with the device. Also, at your desk, uh, consider a corded telephone. There is high EMF that comes off of uh, cordless phones. And if you want to use a phone and not have phone service necessarily, and you don't want to use your cell phone, you can get a cell phone that your service is basically coming through the Internet. So you could have a device that connects to your internet, and then also connects to your phone. Just like you don't want to have wires running under your bed, you should also avoid having wires or power cords under your desk where you're sitting for extended periods, and instead move them as far away as possible. Generally, in your home, I'd recommend unplug things when you're not using them. Also, it can be helpful not to stand next to appliances uh, when they are on. So, for example, you could be in the kitchen preparing a meal and standing in front of your dishwasher, and then by the time you get to your meal, you're tired, maybe irritated, and you think it's because of something someone said that day at work, when it could be the magnetic fields coming off of the dishwasher that have just impacted your autonomic nervous system putting you into a low-grade state of fight or flight. Similarly, I would say don't fold clothes next to the washer and dryer. These magnetic fields, which again, they're not the wireless, but they come off motors, they do tend to drop off pretty quickly, and if you're six feet away, you'd be less susceptible to those. Just know that in most cases, we don't need to fear EMF as much as have respect for it and keep it in its place. If you are sensitive, I would have further recommendations. But again, these are really things that I think everyone could benefit from. And if you're not sure if you're sensitive, you might listen to that podcast I have on electromagnetic hypersensitivity. So lastly, I'm going to comment on chemicals. And this topic is a little trickier because there are a lot of ways that we can be exposed to chemicals. And this is just going to be a very simple introduction and things that you can think about. And I hope to take a deeper dive on all three of these in future podcasts. One starting place with chemicals is to really consider how susceptible we are to marketing. And to know that All of these cleaning products and even body products, which I'm not going to focus on here today, we're all sold this notion that the more sophisticated, the more complicated, the more effective the product will be, when usually the more sophisticated and the more complicated means uh, the more toxic and the more that we should try to keep those items out of our home. Now, most cleaning products we can easily make with vinegar, baking soda, 
And if you don't want to do that, other considerations would be to go to the environmental working group and look up each item, and you can see various brands rated. If you don't want to mess with that, you can also just look for a brand that is generally chemical-free, and that would be, for example, brands such as 7th Generation. Other things that you might consider is avoiding flame retardants when it comes to furnishings. You might also consider in the kitchen removing plastics and instead having containers that are glass. For cookware, using stainless steel and or cast iron will limit your exposure to harmful chemicals. When it comes to pest control... If you use a service, you can usually, especially in larger areas, find companies that have more organic-based treatments. They'll often, in fact, use things like thyme as a pest control. Lawn care, avoiding pesticides and chemicals as much as possible. Again, depending on your area, if you use a service, you can often find a company that will uh, limit the use of chemicals. You might consider getting allergy covers for your mattress and your pillows. This does a couple things. Uh, One of the reasons I like it, aside from keeping the dust out, which if you've ever read the research on how much dust accumulates in mattresses and pillows, it's quite striking. But also if you do have a situation where you end up having some water damage, it's good to know that your pillows and mattress have been protected because the negative pressure when you lay on a mattress, when you put your head on a pillow, and when you sit on a couch as well, will pull in whatever is in the air. So allergy covers on mattresses and pillows can be helpful with that. For additional air purification, you can do anything from making your own using a 24 by 24 box fan and duct taping a high quality 24 by 24 air filter onto that and there's a on youtube if you look up 25 dollar air purifier uh, they'll talk about how you can make that and while that's not as high quality as a product like austin air it's certainly more affordable and aside from austin air there's many different air purifiers that are of higher quality. There are lots of options, and I know even amongst my functional medicine colleagues around the country, they have different preferences. For water, similarly, there are less expensive options, a zero water pitcher or putting a water filter onto your faucet. There's the Berkey, which is a stand-on-the-counter water filter that doesn't need the filtering pieces changed regularly. And then there's reverse osmosis for the whole house. So I'd like to answer a few questions that came in. And the first was someone that's looking at places to move and they're finding a lot of smell like dryer sheets, plug-ins, and other chemical fragrances. And I should have mentioned that any time you can avoid fragrances... You want to do that, not only because of immediate immune reactivity that can occur, but also because of the chemicals that can store up in the body that are in these fragrances. And again, this is a topic I can go into more in a future episode. So this person is struggling to find a place to move and wants to know if there is any way to get rid of these smells in an otherwise ideal home. And this question, too, would be relevant to someone who perhaps has a lot of fragrances in their home and is now wanting to get rid of them. So there is a nice article that I would refer to, and it says, Get Rid of New House VOC Off-Gassing Odor. And they run through a number of strategies. And this is on a website called My Chemical Free Home which has a number of resources in this regard. Another question was regarding EMF and how exposure can be reduced when living in a city and there are neighbors close. This would be where considerations about 
EMF shielding. Now this can be possibly having a canopy over the bed so that when you sleep at night, you're not getting some of that additional EMF exposure. It could also be in some cases using shielding paint and even shielding on the windows. So there are definitely strategies. However, if you're not in a situation where you don't have any other choices, the preferable route really is to lower exposure uh, where you can. There was another question about uh, the workspace, and I would say really applying the same things that I talked about with a home office as far as considering wiring your keyboard and your mouse, turning off Bluetooth, moving the wires away from your workspace as much as possible. Even if you can move two feet from your screen, that will be helpful, and you can always magnify using a keyboard setting the size of the font so that you're not straining your eyes. And lastly, there was a question. I love to hear all about EMFs, uh, symptoms of EMF exposure and toxicity, and how to reduce them in our homes without breaking the bank. So I hope I covered some of that, and I, again, cover some of that as well in a electromagnetic hypersensitivity episode, and I look forward to doing um, podcasts and probably more than one in the future on various aspects of EMF. If you know someone who you think in particular could benefit from this information or someone with brain-related symptoms or chronic health conditions and they're starting to look at the root cause, they may find this useful. If you would like to help me get this information out into the world, consider sharing, liking, or commenting on one of the social media sites or on Apple Podcasts. I'll look forward to connecting with you either on one of those sites or on a future podcast episode. Until then, take care.